Hello, I'm Mildred Solomon, president of the Hastings Center, which is often described as the first bioethics research institute in the world. We're located about an hour north of New York City. And I'm here with Arthur Kaplan, professor of bioethics at New York University Langone Medical Center and the founding director of its division of medical ethics. We're here to talk about the wise use of emerging biomedical technologies and how we can ensure benefit from scientific breakthroughs while minimizing potential harms. To do that, we're going to focus our discussion primarily on the rapid development of COVID-19 vaccines. And I'll be asking Professor Kaplan about the ethical questions that arise in the context of both vaccine development and deployment and how we can best manage those ethical challenges. So, all right, let's begin. So far in Europe and the United States, the vaccines that are in use have been approved quickly under emergency use authorizations. That makes sense since they've demonstrated very strong efficacy and because COVID-19 is such a dire threat to both health and economic well-being around the world. But has there been a cost to the speed of these developments? Hi, Millie, thank you for uh, meeting with me. I think the answer to the question is yes, there has been a cost. Remember, emergency use authorization in, uh, permitted by American regulators and then later adopted by European regulators and others has never been permitted on such a scale as we see with vaccines. <clears throat> emergency use authorization in the past was for a small number of people facing a threat, a problem, <clears throat> disease, or an infectious outbreak, or a terrorist attack. I'm going to say the number of people affected was in maybe the hundreds, possibly the thousands. The world is being vaccinated on an emergency use authorization. We've never seen anything like it. It creates unknown circumstances uh, both legal and ethical. But let me mention two. One is when you have emergency use authorization, people worry that what's being uh, delivered to them in the form of vaccines may not be safe. We've seen more vaccine hesitancy of a new kind around the world. It isn't just the traditional, I don't like vaccines. I think they're going to uh, be impure or I have some belief that alternative approaches will do better to control disease. Many people are saying, I don't want this, or certainly I don't want to be first, because I think they rushed it. So emergency use authorization combined with some language like warp speed, which is one of the American descriptions for uh, moving vaccines along fast that was commonly used, yeah. sowed doubt and skepticism in many quarters. The other uh, problem with emergency use authorization is it makes it harder, strangely enough, to get a license to get the vaccines fully approved. Because once you've got vaccines available, the normal way to get vaccines approved is to finish a randomized clinical trial with a placebo arm. And you collect data maybe for a year and a half, and then you submit that to the regulator and they give you a full bore license. Well, when emergency use was authorized, it was based on four months data. Mm -hmm. And at that point, a lot of people in the placebo arm said, forget it. I don't want to be in the placebo arm. I want that vaccine. If it's good enough for emergency use, then I'm going to take it. And the studies began to fall apart. Right. It, so it starts it, to undermine the existing studies. And I imagine it will also affect our ability to mount new studies. Precisely. So we're gonna to have to license vaccines with less confidence and less evidence than we did before, just because when something new is out there, it's very tough to recruit people to studies and it's very tough to keep them in studies. And I understand that. I think ethically you have no choice but to offer the vaccine to people in a placebo group. And you certainly have to tell potential new subjects mm -hmm. that these vaccines are available. So those are complications. No one really planned for them, but they're out there. Well, since you led with safety and you've introduced, you know, a, a, a reason, underlying reason why there may be and there is more vaccine he hesitancy, let's talk a minute about risk perception and how we human beings tend to size up our risks. I mean, for example, if it turns out that the Johnson and Johnson vaccine has a problem rate 
of that special blood clotting problem of one in a million, hey, that's far less than the daily death rate from car accidents, but we've all made the calculation that the benefits of car driving are far outweigh the daily death toll in automobile deaths. So, you know, we're in the middle of a crisis, a world crisis. How should we think about this risk calculus now that you've acknowledged that we're doing this in, in a, you know, somewhat uh, riskier way than we usually do? Well, great question. And risk assessment is very difficult for everybody, scientists, doctors, anybody. It's just a difficult area. I think one thing to keep in mind about risk is when you're in public health and trying to promote something to prevent a problem, it makes it even harder for people to com compute risk. If I have cancer, someone says, I'm going to try a new drug on you, and it might hurt you, and it might harm you, you're thinking, well, I have terminal cancer, I'll take risks. I'll allow myself to uh, uh, face, um, you know, any kind of risk that's out there in the hope that maybe I'll be cured. When we take ordinary medicines, we know there are risks associated with them, but we have problems that we're trying to treat, whether it's headaches or psoriasis or depression or whatever it might be. <clears throat> when you come to public health, you're looking at a situation where somebody says, I feel fine, I'm not sick. I don't know why I should take a vaccine that might make me sick. And you're trying to remind them a bigger issue is you're facing a plague of <laughs> an epidemic out there that could kill you or hospitalize you or make you sick for a long period of time, maybe make you sick over a lifetime. We're not even sure about long haul COVID as it's called, right. but it makes the computation very tricky because prevention is not the same as saying, I feel sick, therefore I'll take a risk to make me feel better. I think that's the hardest part of all. The yeah. other difficulty is you gotta give analogies and metaphors. You gave a great one, driving. It's not enough to say to somebody, the risk is six in 250,000 that you'll get a cerebral blood clot. People sort of hear blood clot, not six, and they don't know what the denominator really means anyway. So you've got to give them analogies like you did. I sometimes say the risk of a blood clot associated maybe with vaccines, not proven yet, but associated is less than the risk of getting hit by lightning. I mean, it's a tiny micro risk. So it's difficult to explain that sometimes. I think people feel differently when they are proactively taking an action rather than walking through the woods and lightning strikes. There's a sense that we don't have any control over that. All right, let's go back to what might be lost if we don't have the ability to maintain these trials for long, the existing trials for longer and, or new studies th that we'd wanna do. So let's talk about the existing, the existing trials, why it's beneficial to continue them and how um, sad it is, but understandable that people in the placebo group are, are departing. What knowledge is it important that, to be, that we continue to gain uh, that these studies, if they continued longer term, could yield for us? Well, it's a good question because remember, other people may say, let's seek early approval for other things. And you want to know, well, what would you lose if you went more toward an emergency use authorization model for future drugs or future vaccines or whatever? What, what are you giving up? And you're giving up a number of things. When you can't do a large scale randomized clinical trial, right now, we don't know how long vaccines last. Six months, a year, two years, we don't know. To study it, you'd wanna monitor people in a placebo group <laughs> against yeah. vaccine over time. That possibility is gone. We, we are not gonna get the answer that way. And that means you have to track people and try to collect, if you will, real world evidence on them, much more difficult to do. Another problem, there are new strains circulating. It would be nice to know, are these vaccines effective against emerging new strains of the COVID virus? Well, again, we can look at that, studying vaccinated people, but much more difficult when you don't have a placebo controlled <laughs> trial to get the answer to that question. The other one I'll mention as a real difficulty down the road, maybe uh, a vaccine is better at prevention than another one. So if you wanna compare vaccines, it would be nice to be able to do that like in a large trial 
with randomization and again, a placebo arm. We're mm -hmm. never going to do that. Now we've got many vaccines approved, more coming in the pipeline. So if someone really says, let's just say, is Pfizer better than Moderna, is better than AstraZeneca? We kind of know what the early results were that got them early approval, but we don't know what the real results are over a significant period of time. Do you think the real world data on whether or not the vaccines curtail transmission and how long the immunity lasts, do you think the real world data will be sufficient or should we be considering things like challenge trials? Well, first, when you have early approvals and you're trying to uh, make guesses about how long has this uh, uh, thing working, <laughs> um, you're going to do it with less confidence and you're going to do it with uh, less uh, assurance when you have to do real world evidence, only because it takes a lot longer to compare things when everybody's been vaccinated. Ironically, in some parts of the world, when virus begins to tamp down or go away, those, those comparisons become very difficult too, because you don't have natural infection at the same rate. Some people say, well, then move the study to India or Iran or Brazil where the outbreaks are big. But again, you're chasing the virus all over the place. The long-term goal is to get rid of it. And so, you know, hopefully you're not gonna be able to do a, a real world evidence trial uh, because you tamp down the virus, even though we need the answer. So I've been in favor under limited circumstances of undertaking challenge trials. I've been arguing for this with some colleagues for some time now. Challenge trial, as you'll remember, Millie, is deliberately infecting someone. That right away puts us in ethically murky waters. You're exposing someone to a dangerous agent for which we don't really have a reliable cure. There are antibodies now and treatments, but you many people die from COVID. Yeah, and historically, challenge trials have only been used when there was a remedy. We knew we could rescue people if they got in trouble. Right, and we don't have that here. I, yeah. I would say that what you said was 90% true. There have been a few oddball studies, yeah. uh, but generally yeah. you're right. And so it's really taking a huge risk. We do know that younger people don't seem to get as sick, don't seem to get uh, a die at the same rate. So you could recruit trying to minimize the chance of death and you'd be standing by trying to pour antibodies into people if they showed the first symptoms. All that said, you would only need 400, 500 people to really know through deliberate exposure what's going on with these vaccines because you have them in a centralized place. You're watching all the biological responses and you know exactly when they got infected, it would speed the answers to questions that the world needs. Only volunteers, I certainly believe. I've even argued, don't pay anyone. Don't want any complications right. about inducement or coercive payments that have to be pure volunteers. It's a drastic experimental step, but it's one I think we may, well, I think we'll find ourselves turning in that direction, at least partially, because there's no other way to get rapid answers that we need. You know, are, you've answered my question about are there is there a cost to this to the, the use of emergency use authorization and the speed of this miraculous development? So I think it behooves us to um, counterbalance those concerns that you've named um, with some reassurance. Could you describe the kinds of monitoring and tracking systems that are already in place in Europe and the United States that are expressly designed? to identify safety concerns once a vaccine is out there in use. I think we need to reassure people that, that we do have infrastructure for um, studying safety um, once these vaccines are out the door. How does that work? Well, I, I'm shocked to hear that you want some positive news, but okay, um, we can go down that path. So two <laughs> bits of good news there. One, FDA has long had a system in the US for requesting reports from physicians about adverse events. And that's why we know about the blood clots in the US. Right. People did report them. That lets the FDA then look at data in a select group and see whether there seem to be more of these adverse events. CDC does have a, let's call it real world evidence tracking program in place to follow a sample of people trying to collect information on them. They say they're, it's robust. They say they're very optimistic that they can do this. 
And hopefully uh, they will be able to, if you will, get people to come in, get exams, check them out. It's a, it's, uh, a little bit of a challenge, but anyway, the program is set up to do it at our CDC. In Europe, the regulators have been even tougher about wanting reports when things get out into the world on drugs and vaccines. They have a good track record as well. Remember, they too picked up the AstraZeneca problem relatively quickly. Britain has a good system. The uh, European Union has a good, it's called phase four out in the world tracking system. If we beef them up and throw some more money in there, I'd be even more optimistic that we could get answers. Great. Um, and <clears throat> second surprise, Art, here's another question about uh, positive implications of the pandemic. Um, I think there's some lessons that we've learned from the, the pandemic experience that we can take forward that might allow us to speed up drug development in the future. Um, speed is not necessarily our enemy and we may have learned some things. Can you, what do you, what do you think? Where are we with that? Yeah, I think that's a really <clears throat> interesting question. And let me give you, a, make that concrete, if I may. I have a lot of patient groups calling me up and saying, where's my warp speed? I have Alzheimer's. I have a relative with Alzheimer's. It's a crisis. It's not a COVID pandemic. It's a personal crisis, but it's an emergency. I have ALS. I have whatever disease might be killing them, cancers and so on. I need warp speed. I need faster drug development. You've just done it with COVID. What's gonna happen with me? So we're gonna see those pressures that you're talking about to use the lessons that we've learned about speed and efficiency from COVID to apply to other diseases absolutely uh, coming. And manufacturers and uh, pharmaceutical companies and biotech are well aware of the same issue. So I'll mention a few things that I think we have learned. One, the reason that uh, things went fast with COVID vaccines is that the government was willing to buy product on yeah. the assumption that something would work. If you prepay, you're gonna give incentives to companies to enter into the market. We did that in the US and Canada and many other countries. There's a lesson there, maybe we don't spend the same amount, but by taking the risk out more from the uh, uh, gamble of trying to develop a successful vaccine or drug, you can speed it. Another thing, if you have a placebo group, that's great, but we don't need 10 companies trying to develop the similar drugs with 10 placebo groups. Shrink it, cooperate, that's have one placebo group. Um, we've learned that, you know, trying, to, well, anyway, it's obvious. It's just more efficient to do it that way. <clears throat> if you have data being collected, harmonize it, integrate it. We've got to do better with our data registries and our data sets. Everybody does it their own way now. The investigator does it their way. The NIH has ideas in the US about what to do. Companies collect data. Patient groups collect data into registries. We've got to make them the same so you can compare quickly. That's uh, uh, just a must in terms of becoming efficient. The other thing I'll say is, I think we've learned that if you have money that you wanna move at something, it really requires carefully looking at where the science is. You know, those vaccines move fast, Millie, because platforms for vaccination had already been established because of MERS and SARS, cousin viruses to coronaviruses. Well. We spent a lot of money to do the research, but we banked on knowing that the science was ready. We've got to do a better job spending our money on where the science supports it. Sadly, there are some diseases we don't understand that well. Continuing to pour funds, scarce money there, doesn't make as much sense as saying, let's take the fruitful path. Well, as an implementation scientist, I really like that recommendation. It says, let's put as much energy and effort or more where we can move things out to be effective as we do in, in basic research, we need to do both. And we often forget <laughs> moving to the final stage where it really makes a difference. I love your design suggestions. You're basically saying, let's be smarter about how we design research. And you gave two very concrete ideas, a common placebo group. I mean, how smart is that? And comparable registries and databases that are created with the same architecture and the same variables. Do you think that regulatory agencies could play a role in demanding that? 1000% yes. The funders can drive this. 
They can say, we like designs and we're gonna give priority to common database registries. We really wanna see what you're doing. Sometimes it's called a platform trial where you're running your uh, drugs or vaccines against one another with that common placebo group. They can make this happen. I, I would love to move to the sort of the social science and the, hum, and the humanity side of this question of how we motivate um, people to, to become vaccinated. You mentioned earlier, you know, the levels of vaccine hesitancy are really high. In the United, the latest poll I saw in the United States says that 60% of Americans say they will get vaccinated and the remaining 40% um, are split between a group that's kind of wait and see People have, uh, have called them the swing voters. They could go either way. Many of them probably will decide to get vaccinated, but that's not a certainty. And then a, another group, thankfully a little smaller that are outright no's. I'm not sure exactly what the <clears throat> proportions are in Europe, but I know that there's really large groups. And the tricky thing about this as a social scientist is that the reasons are all very different. So in my view, they would take very specific highly targeted um, approaches need to be designed for each audience. And I know that we're beginning to do that yesterday or a couple days ago, I interviewed <clears throat> Rita Boyd, who's been designing specialized messages for um, the African-American community. Um, I, at the, in the same interview, I recommended that we take a look at some very interesting things that are being done for the white evangelical community. And then last night I saw um, the head of our National Institute of Health um, making the same point um, that there isn't a uh, contradiction between one's religious beliefs and getting vaccinated. <clears throat> um, Art, Art, what are your thoughts about vaccine hesitancy and any advice both for Europe and the United States? Tough issue. Disappointing to see as much hesitancy in the middle of a lethal plague, you know, 550,000 plus Americans dead still seeing hesitancy, uh, despite enormous numbers of people dead and hospitalized. Europe, uh, by the way, you're right, has similar issues. Vaccination rate in Japan, as we speak, less than 1%. Oh cultural uh, considerations come in there. So complicated problem, you're right and smart to point out that different communities are gonna require different messaging. One size does not fit all, you, you have to target uh, the source of the resistance. And in the current situation, some people fear speed. You hear it a lot. I don't want to be first. You know, you get it, Art. And if you're still alive in six months, then maybe I'll get it. Um, so that's a different kind of worry than somebody who says vaccines are made by pharmaceutical companies. They're just trying to profit. The thing to do is to breathe fresh air and eat a lot of herbs. That's a different set up to uh, vaccine resistance. I'm going to say a few things here, though. One, I do think we need to build a social science institute that's like the National Institutes of Health, exactly. biological and medical. We don't know the answers to these things, in part because we have not done what we should to get messaging out. You know, it's great to have drugs and vaccines. If you don't spend money on behavioral psychology, if you don't spend money on messaging, marketing, and learning about that and big money, then you can't translate into application. There are all kinds of people who resist or don't wanna do something or are non-compliant or don't take their medicines the right way. And we have not done what we should around the world to fund it. So I think that needs attention. I didn't know you were gonna say that Art, but that is a favorite of mine because early in my career, I was a health communicator. Yeah. And the one thing we learned as we were designing inter com communications for different public health messages is they absolutely, you have to do the basic research on the beliefs and attitudes and situations, not just beliefs and attitudes, but access questions, for example. Some people have better access to vaccines than others. And you have to do that research to understand context comprehensively before you can ever begin to know what you should be doing. So I'm glad to I mean, one of the that. funny things, Millie, just to give you a concrete example, in the US, and it was in other countries too, one group that jumped up early and said, we're going to get vaccinated to build confidence was politicians. You may remember our vice president then got vaccinated. Many politicians stepped up and got vaccinated. And I kept thinking to myself, I'm no social scientist, but 
you're really going to try and build trust by saying a politician got vaccinated? <laughs> yeah, really. and like, I don't know, maybe. Okay. Um, I doubt it. So, you know, yeah. is it celebrities, social influencers? Are you trying to reach 20 year olds as opposed to 50 year olds? Different people matter to them or would impress them. Exactly. All that said, <laughs> Here's Sorry. some skepticism. Hesitancy is deep and we got to overcome it quickly. I think what we're talking about in terms of understanding better messaging and targeting messages to the African-American community in the US or other countries or the state police, 30% of them in Massachusetts are declining or nursing home staff, 40, 50% of them are declining. That's healthcare workers. Yeah. I favor being tougher. I think we're going to have to move toward mandates because we need speed in beating this epidemic back. I can't believe you'd run the Olympics, for example, in Japan with a less than 1% vaccination rate. The thing is coming in a few months. Um, you're going to really bring the world to your doorstep and not vaccinate? I think you have to require it if you're going to have an event like that take place. And so I would you say you anticipated my next question, if I'm if I may just sure. insert there. What you know, so um I have a, a whole series of questions about mandates. I'm not sure we'll have time for all of them, but let me just say what conditions, what are the conditions and the types of, of people that where you think a mandate would be acceptable? So I would start with healthcare workers. We already have a precedent in the US, and I push for this myself we mandate flu shots. And I was involved in that movement. I know it well. Healthcare workers were not getting flu shots. We gave them the facts. We brought them the vaccines. We had a jamboree. We gave them free hot dogs. They had a clown. Couldn't get the rate above 65%, no matter what the heck we were doing. And that was in children's hospitals where vulnerability is huge. You got to vaccinate your healthcare workforce, nursing home staff, doctors, nurses, people who have clinical contact, very, very important to mandate uh, COVID vaccination. Second group I would look to is probably trying to mandate your first responders, ambulance, police, fire, and say, look, you're, you're gonna be dealing with people, you might be exposed, you're in close contact all the time, you gotta do there. I would also be watching to mandate a different group, back to college, and it's already started to happen in the US. More than 50 schools have already said, if you're gonna live in the dormitories, in congregate settings, you're going to have to show proof of vaccination. And by the way, Millie, you know, those colleges already were requiring that for meningitis vaccination. Again, it's an add-on. It's not something new. It's saying we know there are high exposure risks. I'd start with those groups. Businesses are probably keeping an eye on what's going on here. I think you'll build momentum. I wouldn't try to mandate everybody, you know, you, me, the world right away. Start off incrementally moving, ready to move fast, but, uh, right. you know, start off with the most vulnerable groups, if you will. I've, and the ones that serve the public interest. Um, yes, and but, protect you know, others, yeah. I, it's important to underscore, at least in an American context, that you did not talk about the government mandating these. You're talking about employers. Yeah, and private entities basically yeah. uh, moving that way. Yeah. The government is afraid that if they try to mandate something in the U.S., they'll stir up another fight about vaccination and being not required to do it that we saw with masking in the U.S. And we saw it a little bit in Germany and some other countries as well. So they're nervous about that. Maybe rightly so. For reasons you know, that are, I was going to laughingly say, for reasons that are cultural, you know this, Americans are more prone to accept the private entity's requirements than they are government's requirements. Right. That could probably take us about 50 years of moral psychotherapy to figure out what's going on there, but so be it. And we can learn a lot from our European colleagues. So the, in the questions and answers section of this, I'm, I'm sure we're going to talk about that. One last thing I want to say about the mandates already, I've heard ridiculous um, comments coming saying, well, that's an invasion of my liberty to, to, that, that somebody would mandate this. Um, or it's discriminatory. You can't discriminate against me like that. I think it's really important that we get out ahead of that those false arguments because liberty is not the same thing as license. We shouldn't be talking about this as a liberty issue. Uh, people's liberty ends when it when their actions harm others and not getting vaccinated is likely to be harming others. It looks like it does affect transmission. It does create immunity, at least for some period of time. And so it's not just a personal choice 
whether to get vaccinated or not. It's also a choice that affects you know, the rest of us. And it affects also the vulnerable rest of us, meaning people who can't vaccinate themselves, right. newborns, people with immune right. diseases, transplant recipients, cancer patients under treatment. So we have to protect them. They're the most vulnerable. And you're right. This isn't just a debate about what I want to do. It's a debate about what we need. I'll say yeah. one other thing about the liberty argument. I consider it ridiculous. It's an argument that basically says, I do what I want. Really? You can drive your car at 150 miles an hour through a crowded city. You can you know, walk into somebody's house because you're hungry and eat their food. I mean, it's a silly, silly, crude argument. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. It's good rhetoric. People yeah, want to rally to the cause of liberty. It's catching on on social media, unfortunately. Yeah. You know, so yeah, we are all in this together and everybody's decisions to get vaccinated or not affect everybody else. And that'll be my transition to the last question, which really deserves its own, uh, its own time and something we should talk about for much longer, but I would be remiss not to bring it up. We're all in this together, but low and middle income countries are really behind the eight ball in terms of having enough vaccine availability. A few days ago, President Macron of France thanked President Biden for promising $4 billion to COVAX to support worldwide vaccine availability. But he also called on the US to do a lot more and for other developed countries to do much, much more. All right, let's end with the question of how can we work more intelligently and responsibly to ensure vaccine availability in low and middle income countries? So I'll answer that by saying, uh, first, I do defend a, a moderate version of vaccine nationalism, as it's come to be called, meaning looking out for your own country first. And the reason I say that is, morally, I think you have to help your family, your friends, your neighbor, your community, and your nation. Remember, even the WHO is talking about giving aid to nations. They recognize that as a moral category. Yeah. Um, you want to take care of your own so that the situation is at least stabilizing. I think citizens expect that of their governments. I wouldn't want to say right now, with Michigan and the United States still out of control, with a lot of people here <clears throat> still not vaccinated to the point where we can reopen schools, that we should start giving away our vaccines. On the other hand, we have a lot of vaccine. We don't need to worry about <clears throat> running out. We have more than we can use. So I think we've probably reached that point. It's time to start chipping cheaply or freely those uh, surplus vaccines to others. The second thing I'm gonna say about this, and I won't go past that just in the interest of time, we're in a weird situation. Many organizations, WHO, <clears throat> international vaccine organizations are saying, we've got to get vaccine to the poor countries. Ironically, this is a little different situation. Many of the rich countries don't have vaccine. If you looked at vaccine supply in Canada, the rollout is horrible. They're not vaccinating very well at all. Mexico needs vaccines, so might Kenya. The question isn't just, hey, let's all get behind helping those in need. We've got to prioritize again. Maybe Canada, Mexico for the US come first. Maybe Brazil, because it's got a really bad outbreak, gets yeah. ahead of the line. Maybe India is going to get assistance from Europe because they got to go to the head of the line. But it isn't the, just the usual, let's aid Sierra Leone and uh, uh, Mauritius because they're poor. We also have to track where's the need. Well, on that very smart note, I think we are out of time. This was a lot of fun, Art. Thank you. Thank you. Those are great questions.